Hi, everybody. Josh Gerben. Today's episode is actually an appearance I did on the Clienting Podcast. They've been kind enough to let us use it here on our show. I thought it was a great interview where I went over a number of different subject areas on how we have used digital marketing to grow our practice. So I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Kelly Street. I think you'll find it really helpful. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the Josh Durbin Show, because law school didn't teach business. Welcome to Clienting, the place to get information about legal marketing and client development in the digital age. Here are your hosts, Guy Sakalakis and Kelly Street. listeners. I am, as always, super excited to be here, uh, Kelly Street, talking with another amazing lawyer about the awesome things that they're both doing to market their own firm and honestly really market themselves as well, which is a is a great combination. And so, so excited to welcome Josh Gerben here with me today. Hello, Josh. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, absolutely. I uh, was really excited to get acquainted with you and all the myriad of different things you're doing. And so before we dive into marketing your law firm and marketing the business of law, um, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I'm a trademark attorney. I, I started my own practice in 2008 in the height of the Great Recession. I was a couple of years out of law school and the firm I was at did not appear to have a, a long-term trajectory that looked really promising to me. So um, I decided to go out on my own and uh, started with no clients, You know, not a single client, uh, just a website and a Google AdWords campaign and have since built the firm over the last 12 years. We now have four full-time attorneys, uh, one part-time of counsel, uh, three full-time paralegals, an office manager, a digital marketing person. So we've got a full-fledged small business at this point. And um, you basically built that on the back of, of digital marketing over the last 12 years. Wow. That is super cool. It is, I'm I'm sure, so gratifying to have, uh, to know that you started a business at a really tough time and you've not only succeeded, but built a, a really cool, great practice. No, well, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I take I do take pride in the fact when we started it because it wasn't the greatest time, and and but I also think that was an advantage of ours because uh, we were able to come into a, a legal marketplace that was changing, and people were looking for different solutions, lower cost solutions, and we were able to to deliver on that. So it was actually a good a good time to be in the type of business or starting the type of business or law practice that I was, uh, given all the the issues going on uh, at, at that point in time. So um, let's start by talking about how you marketed your or are marketing your law firm. So as Guy always likes to ask and dig in right away, how is your law firm getting clients? Sure. Um, the vast majority of our clients come from our digital marketing efforts. Uh, today, this would be on the back of the search engine optimization campaign that we've been working on for more than a decade. Uh, so just organic Google search. Um, we do have uh, some YouTube advertising that we do, pre-roll ads on YouTube videos, and we do have a significant uh, referral network at this point. You know, one, the nice thing about being in, in business or in practice for yourself for 12 years is that um, you get your name out and, and you know, we're getting a lot of good referrals and, and repeat business at this point, too. Um, but the, the vast majority of sort of new clients that haven't met us before are all coming in on the, uh, on the back of our um, our. our digital marketing efforts. Awesome. So you're doing SEO. What kinds of things make up your SEO campaigns? Are you doing link building kinds of things, um, content, trying to get that on other sites? What's, uh, what are your plays there? Sure. Um, you know, you name it, uh, we're probably doing it. Uh, we do a, we do a lot of content creation. Um, so a lot of writing, a lot of videos. Um, we do, um, we do some guest posting uh, here and there. Um, we do um, you know, we try to do link building as well. Um, that's obviously a major component of things. Uh, so really, you know, SEO is something that 
what I always try to tell our lawyers is that it's it's a long term investment. It's not something that you're going to start doing in three four months down the road. You're likely to see really any significant return on investment from. It's going to take years and years. It probably took us two or three years to really get a significant ROI on it. And this was starting, you know, 2008, 2009. Uh, nowadays, you're starting in an extraordinarily competitive marketplace, um, especially with, you know, legal services uh, in most cases. Um, so it could be something that takes a long time to really provide anything. Uh, but yeah, it, at this point, you know, that's, we've been just doing it consistently for 10 years and, and that tends to be, um, you know, I think why we we're, we have success with it and all the content we've been able to put out essentially. Yeah. You know, so um, I hear we talk about this a lot, this long game of SEO, and I know it's something that at Attorney Sync, we're kind of always trying to tell our our clients especially new ones who are new to the SEO game of you know it it takes it can take a long time we're going to do everything that we can to build you up a little bit faster but how do you keep the faith i guess so to speak how do you uh, just stay engaged and keep working on it even if you're not seeing any increase in your client load or in uh, form fills on your website that sort of thing I think in the beginning, a lot of it was we would see a small success somewhere and we would see that that did have an impact and we were able to bring in a couple of clients from that small success or whatever it would be. And when you're running a business, you always have to think about your short term investments in your marketing and advertising and your long term investments. Um, and I've always viewed SEO as something that we were going to spend money on monthly and we were going to chip away at it and we were going to invest what we could. And that budget has grown over time. Um, because the firm's grown over time, we have more money to allocate to it. Um, but it was something that I just figured, hey, look, I'm investing this money back in the business. At the end of the year, that's money I don't pay taxes on. Um, it's you know, it's it's a good investment. It's investing in in our growth, and we're gonna have to, um, uh, we're, we're gonna have to, like you say, sort of have the faith that eventually this is going to pay dividends. Uh, because when you read up on it and you you look, talk to other lawyers who have had success with it, you know it works. I think one of the things that can be really challenging for lawyers and especially those that are in small practice or running their own practice is finding a good match for an outside SEO agency to help you because we've, we've had a couple, um, you know, over the years. And I, the good news is, is that I kind of know enough and educated myself enough about SEO to be dangerous. So I knew the value of what we were getting out of you know, the agency. And so there would be some agencies where I knew we were getting really great value. Um, and then sometimes we would move to a different, you know, if we moved to a different agency, you know, the one, for example, we had one agency that got bought and um, they came into a larger agency and then things kind of went off the rails for us. So we started to have to move around a little bit and we could see big differences into what, you know, people were providing and, and for the, you know, for what fees they were charging. And, and that's something where you really need to be an educated consumer as a lawyer when you're, when you're working with these agencies, because it is a long play, right? They can't deliver for you likely in two or three months. You have to have a lot of trust in what they're doing, but you also have to inspect what they're doing to make sure they're doing what they should be uh, to get you in the, on the right path. What were the kinds of things that you did when vetting? So you you obviously you said you're educated yourself, and it's obvious that you are in both the way you're speaking about it and the things that your law firm has been able to do to grow from, you know, zero to to where you at you're at now. But um, when you're thinking about uh, a new agency or when you started to think about working with one in general, what were the kinds of things, the questions you asked or the kinds of things that lawyers should have in mind? Sure. It's a great question. Um, you know, typically if you've ever worked or looked to hire an outside SEO agency, they like to work on, on monthly retainers. And I get that, you know, you want to have a consistent amount of work that you're doing for a particular client every month and you allocate certain time to certain tasks. So obviously the one question is, what kind of budget do you think is going to be necessary to move the needle? Uh, because I don't want to spend $1,500 a month and two years down the line have nothing to show for it, where if we needed, you know, if we needed to spend 5,000 a month or 10,000 a month or what, you know, whatever, what, you know, I want to know from the agency what they, what they need from us to be able to move the needle because, you know, ultimately the agency should know what's out there and what they have to overcome to get the client into a position where they, they are seeing an ROI and, um, and, a good agency will know what kind of time they need to spend and what type of investment they'll need from a client. So I asked that question um, because I want to know the honest answer. I don't want them to just try to sell me a package, you know? Um, 
the other thing I want to know is what type of work they're going to do. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, the, the you know, past couple of years, you know, everybody keeps talking about content is king. So they, you know, we hear about content, content, content. Well, it's like, okay, well, how are we going to create that? You know, are you going to, you know, are we going to have writers create that? Or are we going to be responsible for our attorneys creating that? Um, where is that going to come from? Um, and then we, you know, we typically try to ask, you know, what type of on-site work they're going to do. So, you know, are they going to look at um, site structure? Are they going to, you know, what what is their plan for internal linking? You know, we want to kind of make sure that they're they're looking at you know that aspect of it. Um, we want to know about uh, what type of link building they're going to try to do for us. I think one of the things that's a major red flag that a lawyer should pay attention to is I've had agencies tell me that you don't really need links anymore. And I know, <laughs> and I think that that's okay. So, I mean, I've had people tell me that, that, oh, it's more about the content and then you'll get the links naturally. I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, people don't just give out links just because, you know, you're writing a blog. I mean, sometimes, yes, we get those, but it's a lot of times you still need to do a lot of link building. And we want to know what this, what is the agency strategy for that? How are they going to accomplish that? How many, you know, what type of links do they envision us getting? How many links do they envision us getting? Um, all those kinds of things. We just try to pepper you know, with questions to understand, you know, what we feel the overall competent, competency of the agency is, or, you know, and, and, and really how much time they're going to plan to invest in in the work they're going to do for us, for what they're pitching us. Yeah. And even who is doing the outreach for getting those links, because I'm sure you are on the receiving end of these at times too, but I get so many spam emails where people haven't even bothered to fill in my name or our company or whatever. There are just, you know, it's like insert company name here. And I'm like, hey, thanks, Spam Link Builder. I mean, we we don't put links on our site anyway, but it's like, dude, you know, at least have your person fill in the name of the company that they are doing outreach to, if nothing else. And link building today has become more, as I'm sure you know, has become more of a relationship building and value proposition than it is just, I need a link, right? And so the question is, you know, we want to make sure when we're going out and, and looking to acquire links, you know, how are we going to do that in a way where we're bringing value for whatever site is going to, we're going to be asking for a link? Because we're normally not just going for a, a shotgun approach, we're going for more of a surgical approach these days in, in building links. And so, um, yeah, those type of emails. I mean, you're just everybody's wasting their time. Um, you know, in my view, if you're going to be doing a campaign like that, I think that's a great point. Is sort of you know, it, it goes to you know, who's going to be working on this? You know, are we having a a higher level person, or are you you know, is your first year um, you know uh, new hire going to be trying to email people and get links for us? Because that's that's typically not going to um, uh, you know bear the type of fruit that you really need from a link building campaign. Yeah, exactly. I uh, This is not a, a legal thing, but I was having a conversation about link building with a friend of mine who um, owns actually a, a gun parts online company. And he was saying that they hired a friend of a friend's agency to to do some link building for them. And now six months later, they are having to undo everything they did because they they took that shotgun approach where they just got them links on all of these super random websites that have nothing to do with their actual company, but they could show them, oh, we got you 200 links last month. And it's like, you know, we we maybe don't need to be on that you know, have a link is not necessarily you commenting on some random forum about that has nothing to do with anything for our business about how you can buy gun parts on this website. And uh, that is that, you know, if you want the numbers of links, but you don't care about the quality, sure, great, go for it. But quality of links definitely are what is going to lead to people actually visiting your website and getting some turnover from lead to client? There's absolutely no question. And I will tell you that I've even known attorneys that because, you know, they're not aware of what the agency's doing and they're just seeing some initial results, don't know where all the links are getting built. And then they find out later when all of a sudden, you know, Google comes in and they're, all of a sudden their rankings disappear and, and they have to figure out why. And and it's because, you know, all these links were built that really shouldn't have been. And and that and that is something that is, like you say, you ha basically have to then pay to have them undone, which is just, you know, so it, it's very important. And this is why I think, you know, lawyers need to really educate themselves when they're going out and hiring anybody and, and making sure that they have a short leash on understanding where links are getting built 
um, for their law firm because that's how they're going to be able to evaluate whether or not um, you know those links truly have any value uh, over the long term or whether they're going to provide maybe a short term you know shot in the arm but then Google's going to realize what's going on and, and you're going to drop you know like an like an anchor in the rankings. Oh, I am so happy to have this conversation and have it be very focused on lawyers educating themselves because they're, I mean, understanding what your agency is doing is so huge. And the fact that um, I want to go back to, you talked about your budget and the B word is such a terrible word. (laughs) And when it comes to legal marketing, people are just like, what budget? Um, Not everyone. As we talked about in our last episode with, or one of our last episodes with Allison Shields and the ABA marketing report, so many, I mean, I believe it was around half of law firms don't have a marketing budget or haven't identified one. And so I I just want to kind of dip in a little bit and talk about how early on, how you defined your budget, how you took the painful step of saying, no, we have to dedicate some amount of money to to marketing to in order to get clients. Wow. Yeah. Well, I I hope that trend continues for my sake. (laughs) Um, I mean, look, if you're running a law firm, you're running a business. And I don't know many businesses out there that survive without marketing and advertising. And to not have a budget for marketing or advertising, and if you're running a law firm, just, just shocks me. I mean, very early on when we started the firm, I mean, the very first thing I was doing was Google AdWords. And Fortunately, in 2008, Google AdWords were a lot less expensive than they are right now um, when, you're, when we're bidding on keywords. And so, you know, we were starting to, to see profitability really in the first couple of months of, of having the firm open. And as we got to a certain point where I was like, wow, you know, okay, we've, we're making money this month. We started looking at how are we going to reinvest it? I mean, that, that's always been my thing is how am I going to reinvest what we're making to grow the business? And so we would, that's where we started talking to folks in the SEO world saying, okay, what is it going to cost to get us an effective SEO campaign? Right. And, and when we got those numbers at the time, it was expensive for me. And I, like you said, I, you know, you're making a hard decision, but you know that if you're trying to grow a business and grow a firm, you have to invest in it. And that's what we did. And so it was just a matter of saying, this is what it's going to cost to be effective Let's do it. Let's see what happens. Let's give it 12 months and reevaluate. Give it six months, reevaluate. Are we making progress? You know, how much work is getting done? And, you know, just constantly inspecting the work that was being done and, and ensuring we felt it was on a good path. And that, you know, then it made investing in it very easy at that point. Yeah. I'm so glad that you have had agencies who are, I mean, it doesn't, I can't imagine that you would be unwilling to take, or that you would be willing to take a a relationship with an agency where they weren't showing you everything, but I'm glad that you're both proactive and that the companies that you were working with were, were handing things over and willing to say, yep, here's what we're doing. Here is, here's all the work that's completed. So you could inspect it because That is definitely another thing that I find really shocking is when firms will spend thousands of dollars or even hundreds of dollars and just go, well, you know, I'm just supposed to trust it. I know I'm supposed to spend money on marketing and I'm not an expert in it. And it's like you don't have to be an expert in it to get a report and to see what they're doing and to look it over and go, okay, are the links that they're building, are they links that are on websites that relate to our practice area, websites where our clients would be looking for for things? Are they reputable websites? You know, all of these different little elements that you can check really quickly and you don't have to be an expert in, but you can gain expertise over time. Absolutely. You know, I had one of my mentors in business uh, told me something that sticks with me every single day. You get what you inspect, not what you expect, right? So regardless of how nice somebody is, how much of their friend you are, you know, feel you are with your your agency or your contact or anybody you're doing business with, you have to have a way of inspecting the work and you have to know what you're getting out of it. And and I think that's so critical. And I will tell you, and I don't know if this is still going on because it's been a while since I've been with different, I've been with the same agency for a long time at this point, but we fought to get information about what links were getting built and what was really going on behind the scenes, what the work the agency was doing. 
uh, for a number of years, I, I would I would have issues with the reports being too thin that we were getting from the agencies as to what they were really doing. And I think that's because, you know, in some cases, they probably weren't doing enough work uh, or weren't doing a lot of work or because the links they were building might not have been as good as they should have been. And so, um, you know, at, at some point there was, I, I can remember one instance where we just decided that we were, you know, we had, we started to work with an agency. We were like four or five months in and the reports were just not giving us any information. We said, look, if you can't fix this, we're going to have to be done. And they were, and the answer was pretty much okay. You know, and it was kind of shocking, but it was like, okay, yeah, this is not a good fit at all. You know, and so you just have to be very careful about that, just given how many, um, you know, it's in anything. There's great lawyers and then there's not so great lawyers and there's great agencies out there and then there's not so great agencies out there. And you have to make sure you know what you're you're buying into. Yep, definitely a range. Um, so I also wanted to talk about how you use LinkedIn really quickly. Just, um, I know it's a, it's a form or it's a, it's a platform that has gotten you some clients and gotten you some connections and referrals and repeat business. And so, uh, what are you doing on LinkedIn? Where is your magic? Because, um, I, I just always wonder, is this a place where people go besides when they're looking for a job? It's a great question. Um, my, for anybody listening, uh, if you want to give me a follow on LinkedIn, that is all I've asked for for Hanukkah this year is I, I would like <laughs> more LinkedIn <laughs> followers. Um, they're very hard to come by. It's, it's not an easy platform to grow your following on. Uh, but the, the thing about LinkedIn that I have been, ex we've been experimenting very heavily with it in 2019. I will say before January of 2019, I had, you know, connections on there. I'd make random posts. I, there was not a concerted effort on the platform from me, but this year that has changed. And we've posted a lot of video content, you know, about trademarks, even about just sort of general business things uh, to try to get conversations going. And what I've discovered is that LinkedIn has been really good at deepening the relationships with our current clients and contacts of the firm. So the people that will see my videos, that will interact with me on LinkedIn, the vast majority of them are people I already know. And it keeps me top of mind with them. And also when they interact with me, now other people in their network can see me because that's just the way the algorithm works on LinkedIn. So that's all been very helpful for visibility. And I think, you know, for again, deepening relationships. I would tell you that at this point, I have not personally figured out how to turn that into a lot of new business from a new client perspective right? That, that we can see from search marketing. Um, I, I tried to run some ads on LinkedIn. We've, we've experimented with different things and we have not seen the ability to attract just new clients that we've never heard of or heard from before on the platform. So maybe that's possible. And I'm not saying it's not, um, it, you know, it's just that we have not been able to figure out a way to really make that work for us. I do think it's extremely valuable though, to have your network stay closer to you. So instead of blasting people with emails and saying like, hey, here's an email newsletter from us, it's, hey, follow me on LinkedIn and you can interact with my post as you desire rather than me you know, being intrusive and, and coming to your inbox, so to speak. Yeah, okay, I like that. All right, the, um, and, I, and I will just as a quick aside say that uh, I agree running ads on LinkedIn is very difficult and it is partly because their ad platform is extremely user unfriendly. Is it? And okay, I'm not the only one. <laughs> yes. I, no, I it's terrible. I'm, like, I'm going there and I'm like, what? What are? How do we do an ad? You know, it's like, it, yeah, it's it's difficult to figure out. I agree, and and then it's also not terribly inexpensive right now. So that's been our. Yes, experience. the price has increased dramatically over the last couple of years for ads on LinkedIn. And um, I have found when running them, um, in, and this is for years now, that their targeting is really inaccurate. And the, um, at least for, for me, the, the leads that I'm getting, and maybe it's because people are really inaccurate in their profiles and who they say they are. But um, yeah, I've, I've run ads that are very, very specific and very highly targeted, just like on Facebook and um, gotten some really wacky results. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And that's why, and, and I don't, like you say, it, it's hard to know maybe why, but um, we, it's good to hear that we're not the only ones that are struggling to, to find a way to make the platform work. You know, sometimes I think, oh, maybe we don't know enough about it, but it's, um, 
yeah, it, it seems like there could be some improvements on their end for sure with their with their paid marketing. Yes. And as we always like to do a call out to anybody who is using that platform successfully, if you are doing LinkedIn ads for your law firm or for your own, you know, a solo practice or anything, you know, if you are doing that successfully, please, please reach out and let me know what you're doing and, and we can talk about it because, um, I, I have also not had great success. So anyway. (laughs) <laughs> that would be amazing to talk to somebody that has has done it well. Uh, no question. <laughs> yes. Um, speaking of things that also aren't going well, I know um, we had a pretty great conversation um, before recording when we, you know, first met and and we're talking, and you were really honest about some things that haven't worked for your law firm in your marketing, and so I just kind of wanted to. Um, to ask about that a little bit, because I think it's always really great. You know, we, um, we have people on here, we talk about how, oh, I've learned my lessons, but now I'm really successful and I'm doing all this great stuff, but there are always bumps and bruises along the way. So, um, I believe you have tried mailers and oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, we've done some things that haven't worked, trust me. Um, and, uh, we've taken our fair share of losses. Uh, but yeah, what you're referring to is, is last year I had the idea that not only we're going to do mailers, we, I'm, and I'm still looking at them in my office because I still have a couple hundred of them left that we didn't send out. We created Gerben Law Firm branded boxes. So it wasn't even like we would send someone just a, a letter. We actually have a box that has our logo on. It looks really nice, colorful, our anniversary logo and things like this. And we put in there information about trademarks and about you know, we give them mugs and hats and even chocolates. And we basically were like, hey, you know, the idea here was we we're going to send this to law firms and other lawyers and introduce ourselves with, with, with the box and say, hey, if we can come to your firm and provide a, a seminar to your lawyers on trademarks and brand protection, because a lot of law, law firms just don't have trademark attorneys in-house. And so if they're working with a client, maybe they, maybe they need to identify a trademark or brand issue the client has, and, and we could potentially ultimately help them with that. Um, so the idea was to try to educate other lawyers and, and, and get to know more people. And I sent out, I don't know, a couple hundred of these boxes and we got maybe one email back from someone saying, thank you for the box. And that was about it. <laughs> so it was a significant, you know, investment from a mailing perspective, uh, and just the postage and all the things we put in the box. And, uh, we literally got nothing out of it. And that happens, you know, and that we thought it was a great idea. We thought, oh, this will be interesting. You know, people will get this in the office and maybe they'll be, you know, they'll help be happy to, you know, have us come talk to them. Uh, but, you know, lawyers are pretty tough uh, not to crack and it just wasn't the right way. Painful. Oh, that is mm-hmm. so hard to invest all of that time and that money and all oh, of the time, energy. Yeah. 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 And <laughs> like you, it's something that you feel so great about. And you, I mean, with the branding, boxing and all of that stuff, you, you put your whole self into it and to not have that work out is always just, you know, can really leave a, a sour taste in your mouth, but I'm glad to hear that you are continuing to try other things. And, you know, I'm sure there is an audience for, what you are doing there. And I think maybe could be a bit of an audience uh, in a different way for some of the other things that you were doing when it comes to marketing your business of law and marketing yourself. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. And I mean, one of the things, and this is even another conversation point that I, I would love to talk to people about is, you know, I've been so into the digital side of marketing for the last 12 years that I think I yearn for the more, sometimes the more physical side of marketing, you know, person to person, you know, mailing people actual things instead of, you know, emails. And I, I, I'm, I've sort of become somewhat sort of in a sort of in a, on a side note, like somewhat obsessed with trying to figure out a way to sort of break back into more of a personal you know, physical approach to marketing as opposed to just digital, uh, because digital is getting so loud and so noisy that I'm concerned that it'll be hard to kind of keep breaking through the clutter there as years go on. Uh, but you have not yet figured that out. So I'm always interested in ideas that other lawyers are are using. Yeah. Since you're doing all of this great online PR from your own side to then try to turn that into referrals and speaking engagements and um, creating your 
you know, more of a, um, a public image for yourself, which by the way, when I went to your joshgerbin.com website today and was doing a little research before this, I noticed that you have been featured on Fox News, NPR, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. And so you are already have already done some really amazing work for um, for getting yourself a ton of really amazing big PR. How is that happening? How are you getting all of those opportunities? Sure. I mean, that's another thing that over the years has really built on itself. Um, you know, what we what we end up doing is we try to find um, you know, good trademark stories and, uh, develop relationships with reporters so that, um, you know, maybe one time we're answering some questions that they have about a particular story they're writing, and maybe we're not even quoted in the story or what have you. Um, but we get the contact going and we get the relationship going. And then when we have something we think is interesting, um, you know, we can present it to them and we have an audience. Um, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's sort of PR 101 is the same thing as link building. If you're just going to send a bunch of press releases out to a bunch of reporters, I can tell you they're just going to delete them, right? They get so many of these press releases every day. Um, and that's just not the way you're going to get through the, the clutter and, and get reporters to be interested in what you have to say and, and um, you know, the information you may have. So yeah, that's just been another effort where slowly but surely just sort of built up our list, built up um, all the contacts we have with various reporters in various industries, with various publications, and um, you know, show ourselves as a good resource for information and 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 knowledge. And so, when there's an issue that comes up, you know, a lot of times we get the call. Yeah, I was taken back to when we had Chris Gober on and talked to him about marketing his law firm. I think uh, over a year ago now, or almost a year ago, and um, he and his law firm definitely do the PR approach. And um, they're definitely a different practice area. They're the um, political law and campaign law. And so very different thing, but still really needing to have that public image to get themselves out there and showcase their expertise. And I think one of the things in doing this, you know, a trademark mark lawyer listening might go, well, you know, why would I I, I don't need to be on the news. I don't need to do that. But um, another one of the things that we talked about before this, Josh, was talking about how um, as a trademark mark lawyer, you're essentially competing with legal zoom. And that is a very big difference on quality and pricing and feeling a lot of pressure about your fees. And so showcasing yourself as an expert in all of these ways on the business of law and all of the different, um, just having that public persona can really set you apart so that you can actually charge what your services are worth and not, not feel as much pressure on cutting costs because, oh, they can go on legal zoom and get it for X amount of dollars. Sure. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. Um, I, I think what, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, I will say legal zoom or, you know, we can sort of even broaden it to non-legal service providers because they've sort of, you know, taken the, you know, legal zoom was one of the first. And now you have a lot of them out there, even a lot of you know, directory services with the lawyers in them and things like this. Um, we compete against it all. And, you know, whether it's up counsel comes to mind, um, there's a lot of other, you know, competitors out there that, you know, if somebody wants to file a trademark or has a trademark matter, they can go to, you know, these websites and try to find assistance through the website. Um, and yes, there's varying degrees of quality for sure. I mean, I, you know, the, to me, the old joke is, you know, if, if you were uh, in jail and you had your one phone call, uh, would you call the lawyer with the $99 special or would you call the guy that seemed like he's charging a reasonable value for being an experienced lawyer and knowing the system? And, you know, there's a lot of different customers out there and clients out there in the legal services marketplace. And some people want the, the $99 special because they're in a rush and they don't think that there's a lot that needs to happen and it should be simple and easy. And, you know, they're going to use that option and, and maybe they're going to have success with it. Um, but then there's other people that, you know, are more educated consumers and know that, you know, the value of why you might want to hire a lawyer for something and might understand the value of why a lawyer might need to charge you, 
you know, a thousand dollars instead of a hundred dollars, because if they're going to actually put time into it and spend their, their time on it, they need to be able to account for that and, and, and make a living and, and run a practice or run a, run a business. And so, yeah, you just see this very wide variety of consumers out there and people value valuing things differently. And, and that's getting back to what you were saying about, you know, if, if we're positioned as a quote unquote expert in a field because of a number of reasons, you know, not only the press, I mean, the press helps. I mean, it, I think it's a validation, especially for an attorney in a, in a small firm or when I was on my own, because, you know, people are trying to say like, oh, how reputable is this guy? What does he know what he's talking about? And I think that the press certainly helps validate that. But all the other things too, all the videos I put out on YouTube, I put out on LinkedIn, all the, you know, on our website, um, all the content we produce, all those things go to showing our expertise, showing we know what we're talking about and showing that we can help with situations and, and make and, and, and hopefully get a good resolution for a client or at least be positioned as well as possible to get a good resolution for someone uh, because we just, you know, there's not going to be many people out there that have more experience than we do. And, and that's what we're trying to show over a variety of different factors. And I think that all builds on itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, YouTube. You mentioned it. I sure. was super excited to talk about it because as everybody knows, I love video and um, think it's just, I mean, it's great for so many reasons. It's great because people can then see you and you can, you don't have the uh, loss of expression. People can hear your actual voice. I mean, there are just so many awesome things. And uh younger generations are watching videos way more often than they are reading blog posts or that sort of thing. So um, tell us about your YouTube channel and the different different things you're doing on there. Sure. So I actually have two different channels. Uh, one is just our law firm's channel, which, you know, Gerben Law uh, on YouTube. And then one is I have a my own show. I call it the Josh Gerben Show because I could not think of a better name for it. <laughs> uh, we struggled with the name. I said, finally, we're just going to call it something and get it out. Uh, but the idea there is we're doing a show about the business of law, sort of like we're talking about today, uh, all the different things that I've learned and, and experienced over the last 12 years of running a law practice. Um, so that's just the Josh Gerben show. And between both of those, the videos are, are pretty similar. Um, you know, I built a studio in my office and I stand up in front of a camera uh, with a white background and I talk. And um, and it might be about a particular issue around trademarks, or it might be about a particular issue around the business of law. And, um, you know, we're, it, it's difficult to do. I'm going to tell you right now, we have spent a lot of money building the studio. Every day I come in to do the videos is challenging because I, you know, I'm, it's HD, I wear makeup. Um, and so I had to get good at putting makeup on. I had to get, you know, you have to make sure you're, you're look, you know, you want to have the right look, uh, in my view. I think if you're going to do video, you have to present yourself in a way that, um, you know, you look put together. So it takes some time some days, uh, to look put together, especially in HD. And, um, then you have to actually be articulate and, and find ways to communicate, uh, that are going to resonate with folks. And so though, all those things are a massive challenge, but I think if you do it right, the videos are so helpful. I, I mean, we have a lot of clients for our law firm that, you know, if they have a question about an issue, I'll try to answer it over email and, you know, and I'll say, Hey, before I, we you know, jump on a call, watch this video. And when I get on the call with them, it'll be, Josh, that video was amazing. I understand now. And they just have a few follow-up questions and we're done. As opposed to me taking 30 minutes to give them a dissertation about an area of law and, you know, then them have to try to figure it out on the phone with me on, on the fly. They can study it on their own, watch the five minute video. And if they don't get it, watch it again and then feel good about when they get on the call, they can ask some really informed questions. And so that's where we find the videos are so helpful. Um, not only, you know, again, for existing clients, and then we do get, a, you know, some people that are, um, you know, calling us saying, Hey, we found you guys on YouTube. We really liked the videos we saw. And uh, we have some questions. Might want you to help us out with some some work here. So all those things have been happening for us on YouTube, and I think it's a it's an interesting platform. And if video done right, can be very good. There's no question. That is awesome. Using them as a client education piece, so oh, cool. Yeah. I I have not heard of other lawyers or law firms who are saying, oh hey, you know, um, that's a great question. Check out my video on YouTube. 
And um, because I think it still keeps that personal touch and you don't have to just use an email template of like, okay, here's, you know, um, here's this article on Google that you can find the answer you're looking for. And so it, it's not, it's not any more time than finding something like that or copying and pasting some uh, template information, but it feels a lot more personal and like you're actually engaging with them. Right. They get to know you a little bit through the video and um, you're not, yeah, I, you know, I, I mean, a couple of things there. One, you know, we do a lot of flat rate work, so we don't charge by the hour. And so efficiency to us is key. And one way to get efficient is to cut down on the amount of time you have to spend on the phone on a client call. So if a client calls me and they don't understand something and we have to explain it to them and it can take a really long time, that's cutting down on efficiency for us. Whereas if we can send the client something where they can be truly educated and in an entertaining way, in the sense that we're not just sending them a huge long email and saying, hey, read this and understand it. It's like, no, here's a nice video. It's well packaged. There's graphics with it. You know, it, it's not going to take you too long to watch it. And then they get on the call and they can ask us really pointed questions and get the information they need. It creates a very efficient and process. And also the client feels, again, very good about it because now they know and they can truly understand what we're, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And, and I think that that leads to a lot of, you know, good client relationships and, and ultimately, you know, you know, repeat and referral business. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. So you have, um, as you mentioned, you have your two YouTube channels, your one where it's um, more kind of, I would call them client facing videos or educational videos. Yep. Um, but then your business of law ones, and you have some awesome videos on there of understanding who your clients are and how to attract them. And then talking about um, how to figure out who your actual clients are um, and how to determine who isn't actually going to quote buy from you. And I think that's, that is incredibly, incredibly helpful to know because uh, especially, you know, in, in your practice of law and in lots of other areas of, of, of law where you can find more of a commoditized service to help you out uh there can be that feeling of desperation. So how to kind of um, figure it, you know, get your actual clients that you want to attract who are going to be interested in your services and put blinders on to the rest of the people who aren't. And I think that's really helpful information for people to have. So um, I've watched a few of them. You're very good. And I hope you keep up the good work in, in both of your lines of videos. Oh, no, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. And and yeah, I think one of the hardest things that I've had to learn over the years, and I'm still not extremely good at, is try not to sell the unsellable, as I call it. You know, and if somebody's calling our firm, we can pretty quickly tell whether they're truly interested in hiring us and understand the value we can bring, or if they're just kicking tires or trying to find the lowest price or whatever it might be. Right. And and so um when you if you if you're fortunate enough to be having, you know, a number of leads coming in every day you have to try to allocate your time to the ones that are, you know, percentage wise, more likely to be clients that are going to be aligned with your firm and, and, and being able to identify that and, and understand that um, and just be realistic about who you're talking to, I think is, is, is really important because you could definitely go into a rabbit hole and spend half an hour with somebody that's just never going to engage your firm. And, um, and you would, you know, most of the time know that when the, within the first few minutes of talking to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the last thing I want to go into for just a, um, for the last little bit of time we have here is I also saw that you have some podcast episodes of your very, very own, the Josh Gerben podcast experience. Uh, so <laughs> I, I wanted to just ask a little bit about that. How's, how's that going? Um, are you enjoying doing it? Tell me all about it. Sure. So the secret here is the podcast is just the audio from the YouTube channel, the Josh Gerben oh, show. Oh, there we so, go. <laughs> so we just take the audio from that and we make it a podcast for folks that might want to listen to it. Cause I, I'm that way. Like, I mean, I, you know, I don't have time to sit there and watch a 15 or 20 minute video, but I would love to listen to it in the car. And so we wanted to make sure that the, yeah, that, ac you know, across mediums, you know, people could Inter interact with the content. So if you are more of a podcast person and want to get the same content, you know, it's on Apple iTunes. I think it's on um, 
Spotify, maybe a few other places that our digital marketing person knows about that I don't. And um, but it's out there in the, in the podcast world too. And and yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're, that is one effort. You know, where you know, we've been trying to build some awareness and see if we can get some listeners and if people if the content is 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 what people want to hear. And and so I would love feedback. Um, you know, if anybody listens to a show, you know, we're always looking for feedback on that right now because it's a very new effort for us. Yes, absolutely. I think that is that is really awesome. And because you have invested money and resources, I guess I will call them, um, because you've invested resources in your recording equipment and all those things, you can just easily take the audio and it doesn't sound like a jumbled up recording. Oh, right. Yeah. The way the studio is set up that the the, the audio is recorded on a very good microphone so that, you know, when, um, first off, I think when you're recording a video, one of the overlooked things is how good is the audio because you're so focused on how things look that you need to be careful about how things sound too. But if you're doing that the right way, then most of the time you can just pull the audio track out and, and turn it into a podcast as well. So you can get kind of get a, a little bit of mileage on the, uh, on the recording session, if you will. Yes, we do. We do love to tell people uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. Actually, right. actually, don't reduce, but reuse and recycle. Uh, just get lots, of, get as much mileage out of things as you can. Take a, a video, create a podcast episode, take the podcast episode, create a transcript for it, clean it up a little bit so that you've got a nice blog post. All good things. Yeah, no, completely agree. And there's, yeah, you're absolutely right. Is that you can, you can create one piece of content and, and turn it into 10. And, and that's, um, and that's just something that you have to, you, if you're planning when you're creating the content, you know, you can plan it out that way so that it, it looks pretty natural in all the different places you end up wanting to put it. Fabulous. Awesome. Well, you have shared so, so much great advice with people and your experience and some really valuable takeaways. And so I, I so appreciate your time. And um, so if anybody wants to get in touch with you or have you on their podcast or have you come speak to them about your wealth of knowledge, how can people reach out to you? Yeah, um, very simple. You could just go on our law firm's website, which is gerbenlaw.com. That's G-E-R-B-E-N-L-A-W.com. If you submit a form through the contact page, that'll come right to me and um, you'll be happy to get back to you. You can also reach me on uh, Messenger on LinkedIn. Uh, we're trying to build up the LinkedIn following. We'll give that one more plug. And that's just uh, Joshua Gerben on, uh, on LinkedIn there. So I'm very responsive on both places as far as messages coming in. Well, thank you again, Josh. Um, I hope people do reach out to you to, to ask you some questions and uh, follow up with some things there. And thank you to all of our listeners. As always, if you like the episode, give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or any of your other podcast listening apps or devices. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>